All right, so let's talk about the structure of the, art, the project. The project you're making, this is uh, the last lecture that we're talking about MMO architecture and networking concurrency, explicitly and directly. So let's go over the project and see how it's all going to come together. The lecture question is going to be a Google form. It'll be in lecture, it'll be uh, just a participation thing in lecture. So uh, uh, no coding due tonight is probably pretty important, pretty relevant today, uh, being what's due tomorrow. So no coding, but a Google form, just a few questions. We had one of these earlier in the semester. Same idea uh, as that one. And then when we get to that part in lecture, it'll be right at the end. I'll talk about what the questions are. So when we're talking about architecture, I, didn't, I haven't given this disclaimer as often as, uh, as I probably should. This semester, I do this, uh, I did a lot more last semester. But the architectures that we see in that image that I show, the MMO architecture, it's just one approach of how we can build this, uh, this app and apps of this nature. It is by no means the only way to do it. If you, it's one of those things where if you ask 10 different developers, they're gonna, you're going to get 10 different answers. Everybody's going to have different ideas of, of how the interaction should happen. We're just seeing the, the ways that I designed the project. So don't, um, I, and I see this from time to time, don't fall into the trap of thinking, well, that's how we saw it in class, so that's the only way to do it. The biggest thing to focus on are the core concepts that we're learning, and the MMO architecture, that's just one way to apply the concepts that we learned, one way to use actors, to use web sockets, to use a database, and structure them in one configuration to be able to get, the, get things done and build software that works. Yeah, by no means the only way, if you have, if you sat down and designed your own MMO with those same concepts, you'd have a different design and that's fine, that's completely okay. Uh, and, my, and the way that I show you is by no means the best way either. It, there's probably many different ways to do this just uh, a little better or with certain trade-offs. So, uh, some ways to design it to make the database easier to work with or, uh, or to make the actor system easier or to not even use actors might even be an option. Uh, we want to use actors because it's part of the course concept, but, um, but you might not even use actors if you wanted to design this on your own. So just a disclaimer, this is just one way to get things done, not the only way. So we've seen this picture throughout the last few weeks, throughout the, the last two and a half weeks. I've been showing this picture quite often. Uh, so let's break this apart a little bit and look at this applied to the project, of course, what we're going for. First, I just got one slide on this. Let's see this architecture applied to Clicker. So in that architecture picture that I keep showing you, the actor system is just one block. But that actor system itself gets pretty complicated. So when we go through these architectures, I want to blow up that actor system and see what's happening between those actors and what messages are being passed between them. So this you should be very familiar with at this point. The, the uh, clicker architecture, you built the front ends, both a web and a desktop front end in lab, and you can have many different users connecting to your app. There are going to be uh, as many users as your hardware can support connecting to your app and your network, I guess, depending on what's, what the bottleneck is. They're all going to communicate via web sockets to your app, and they're going to have the web socket server as their point of entry. A user is going to connect, they connect to this WebSocket server, and in our architecture, that server is also part of the actor system. So the server, it has its feet in both worlds, it's the connection to the outside world, and it's also part of the actor system, so it can send actor messages to the rest of the actors in the system that are running concurrently. This, uh, the WebSocket server is the one place where we absolutely need concurrency because if we have two users connecting, well, we have to handle them concurrently. We don't want to tell one user, A, uh, somebody else is connected to the website right now, so you're going to have to wait. We don't, we don't want to say that. That's ridiculous. So if two people send messages to the, over the socket, two socket connections want to come in, you want two sockets connected at the same time, we need concurrency. We have an absolute need for concurrency at this point, and the actor system is our solution to that. So we have the WebSocket server as part of the actor system. It's going to communicate with each of the games that are created. A user connects via WebSocket. The server says, oh, I got a connection from a user. 
they send the register message over the WebSocket, and when you get that, the server gets that register message, creates a game actor that's going to control their version of the game. And then whenever WebSocket messages are coming over that same WebSocket, those are, the server converts those into actor messages and sends it to the game associated with that socket, whether it's clicking gold or buying equipment. And then the WebSocket server is going to get updates from that game actor with the game state and send that over the socket so the user can uh, go through their view code and visualize the current state of their game, namely their current gold and building zone, how much the next building is gonna cost of each type. Each game actor communicates with the database actor, sends messages to the database actor, and the database actor is our, another link to the outside world, outside of the actor system. It's going to communicate with that MySQL server, which is running as a separate process on your machine. So we have two links going outside of this actor system, and everything else is actor messages being passed along, across these different actors in that system. This is notably not an MMO. This is your, the first, uh, I, I like the clicker game because it's one of the simplest things besides like a chat app that we do to death. It's one of the simplest things where we can use a socket server and an actor system to be able to see all these interactions happening without having to worry about users interacting with each other, which adds another layer of complexity in some cases anyway. So we have the full architecture but not using it as an MMO. This, could, this is uh, just running a lot of different single player games for a lot of different clients on the front end. Concurrently. It's concurrency, but not MMO. So, let's look at our MMO for the project architecture. And a lot of this will be new. This is what we'll spend the rest of the lecture looking at, is this architecture for the project. So here, we have our front ends that you built for demo two. These front ends are going to connect via WebSockets to a WebSocket server, just like the clicker. The WebSocket server is going to be the link between the outside world over the internet, over these WebSockets, and the actor system, which together with these three separate systems, um, maybe I shouldn't use the word system there, but each one of those is a separate actor. Each one of these different subsystems of our game the WebSocket server is going to communicate with them to build that one cohesive experience that we're, uh, that we're going after for our users. So let's take a look at each one of these systems one at a time. So first, these four here, WebSocket server, overworld system, battle system, authentication system. Just like in demo two, you got four choices and those are your four choices. So each one of your teammates will build one of those systems. Now there are no teams with more than three members, so you won't have the full app with just those, um, but you'll have those pieces, at least uh, up to three of these pieces built. Uh, and then we'll have, once I have my, my app done, I'll release the demo two and, and all that code uh, as well. But after demo three, I'll release whatever pieces you're missing as well so you'll be able to put the whole app together. So those are your four choices. So today's lecture is all about informing you on what those choices mean, so you can make a meaningful choice in negotiations with your teammates. For demo four, I want to flash forward just a little bit. Demo four, so for demo three, you're going to build all the pieces for the full app. So what's left for demo four? It's actually kind of nothing. So we're not adding any new features for demo four. But what you have to do is take all of the release code, all the shared code, either your teammates or for myself, or for course staff, whatever you can do to put together the full app using the pieces that you've built throughout your demos. Add those to whatever code you're gluing together and make everything actually work together. So in theory, after demo three, you have all the pieces that you need to build the full app. For demo four, it's demoing to your TA and showing that you put the full app together. So this is the end of the functionality for the project. So we're kind of hitting that. Uh, uh, we can kind of see the end. The end is in sight after today. All right, so let's look at the things that we already know. Uh, of course, the front ends. You already built this. The one thing to add is the WebSocket connections. 
When I asked you, when we released Demo 2, when we asked you to do Demo 2, we didn't know anything about WebSockets yet, so of course we couldn't add them for that part of the demo. But they'll have to be added at least for Demo 4. They'll be added. So uh, these front ends, this is just review, of course. The overworld system, we sent the movements. What direction am I attempting to move in? Send that to the server. And then receiving from the server, the map all with all the tiles, whether they're passable or not, and also periodic updates of all of the locations of all of the other parties, whether they're in a battle or not, and their level. So that's all the information that we're getting from the server, and we're sending those, those uh, the direction that we intend to move in to the server. Then we had a battle GUI, where we're sending every action uh, we, uh, we can click the action taken, and then the target, send that to the server, we're going to emit that over the socket, we're going to receive over the socket the current state of the battle, so we can display all the hit points and all the, the characters and whether they fainted or not. We're going to receive action taken events, so we can animate them, and we're going to receive a notification whenever it's one of our players turns so we know to display the GUI. So those are those the network interactions. Everything else you already built, you're familiar with the rest of that. Uh, those are the network interactions that we would add to those front ends, that we'll add to those front ends. The database, we've seen these. Lab this, yeah, this week. Lab this week is all about MySQL. We gave you plenty of warnings about that. We're, uh, we're looking at MySQL. You also know databases from Clicker. You've been seeing this in the Clicker homework throughout, uh, where we have the, the database trait and then two implementations of it. Uh, one for testing and then one for actual MySQL. We don't have to, oops, but uh, uh, for the project, we want to connect to a MySQL server. That actor is going to take actor messages. Everybody's going to be able to send actor messages to that database actor. And then the database actor can convert those into SQL queries and then connect to the MySQL server. This is one of the cases where, where you might get some different answers if you ask different developers. Some people might like uh, to skip the database actor and then have each component, each system, just talk to the database directly. Certainly a viable option. I like putting all of, personally, I like putting all of the SQL code in one file in just one place so the rest of the system doesn't have to be aware of SQL. They can just send the saved messages. And then if I want to swap SQL out, maybe I want to swap my SQL out for MongoDB later on, I would just go into this one file, this one database actor, and then update the SQL to MongoDB that I haven't traced throughout my code. So it's a personal, somewhat of a personal preference. I'd argue that's a, a good architecture to keep all the, the database stuff isolated. But uh, it is, it's uh, one way of doing things. And of course, we're doing this for persistent storage. You've been hearing that since 115. The database is going to communicate to the three subsystems for authentication. This we saw in 115 as well. The when uh, when somebody registers, store their username and password, the hash of the password. And when they log in, retrieve that from the database, look up that, that hashed password, and uh, authenticate them based on it. So the authentication system certainly needs some database storage. Next time that person logs in, we need to look up that, their information, pull some other information about their user account. The battle system is going to store everything about the battle characteristics of each character, their, all their stats, their level, XP earned, all that stuff, the, that uh, battle system had to store all of that information. And the overworld uh, wants to store that map and all the party locations. So all three of these systems have some storage that they're going to need. Some storage needs, they're going to communicate with that database. The database actor send it messages to be able to store that, store and retrieve that information. Okay, so let's start the new things. Let's look at these four subsystems and uh, look at in a little bit more detail of what each one is going to do. So the WebSocket server, the link between the outside world across the internet and the inside world inside this actor system that's actually controlling the game. So this WebSocket server, we can think of this as a controller in our MVC architecture. It's not really handling any logic of the game, 
but it is interacting with the users. So the user is going to send their actions and inputs to this server. The server has to convert those into actor messages sent to the appropriate subsystem. And the subsystems are going to give information back to the server. And the server has to say, OK, I have this information. What socket do I send this to? When do I send this to, to each socket? And, and do all that controlling of the, the game. And kind of gluing together all of the subsystems while interacting with the users. So the server has quite a bit of work to do, mostly uh, data management and just um, message management. A lot of the messages are just forwarding it to the appropriate uh, actor or web socket. But it does have a lot to, uh, lot to pull together. It's the glue code of the entire program. So, and everything else is, is part of the model for demo three. <coughs> so the big things, listening for connections and disconnections over the web socket server. Whenever we get a connection, coordinate with that authentication system saying, OK, I have this web socket connected, uh, but let's hold off on that, wait for them to send either a registration or a login message over this socket, and then we're going to work with the authentication subsystem for those messages to the authentication, and if authentication says they're good, then we're going to allow them to log into the system, create a, a party, uh, load their party from the database, whatever the, uh, the authentication sends back, and get them in the system, talk to the other subsystems, the battle and overworld, and get that information. Tell everybody, hey, this party is now joining the game. Add them to all your data structures. Add them to your physics. Add them to everything that you're doing. Talking to the, uh, the, over, the, uh, the client, the client's going to send those overworld movements to us. Once they are connected, authenticated, the authentication system says they're good, they're added to, to the game. They're going to send the overworld movements. I, and, and those are have the form, I mean, there's some flexibility, you can do it a little different, but, uh, but those have the form of, I intend to move in this direction. And then I have to forward that to the overworld subsystem. The battle action, if I'm getting, hey, I the over the socket, I want to perform this action on this user, because it's my turn, uh, on this character, because it's my turn, forward those to the battle system. When this, as the actor system, this server is going to communicate to the subsystems, of course, some of, this, uh, uh, some of this we mentioned. But when we get the updates is the big thing. We're going to get updates from both the battle system and the overworld system, which are going to be sent over the WebSocket server and eventually call your update methods. Whether you did the battle or the overworld, you had an update method. These are going to call, eventually, those JavaScript update methods to render the new state of the game or the battle in that GUI. So we're going to have to listen to both the overworld and battle systems for those messages, that, uh, the new states of everything that's happening, and forward them to the appropriate web sockets. So those sockets can render, those GUIs can render, the views can render that new information. So WebSocket server, it's a lot of glue code, it's a lot of holding everything together, which ends up being a lot of just forwarding messages to the appropriate parties. Uh, but there is a lot for, if you're choosing the WebSocket server, you have to, at least on some level, be aware of how all of the rest of the app works. So if you are interested in, in that, uh, especially if you're thinking ahead to demo four, uh, now that I think about it, WebSocket server is probably the best choice if you want to think ahead to demo four, because it's going to force you to understand pretty much the whole system um, during demo three. Authentication system. To an extent, this is what we saw in 115, just using web sockets instead of AJAX calls. Uh, but there are some differences. So, and, and a lot of recalling what we did there. So with this, there are two big events that can occur for the authentication system, of course, register and login. When they register, create that account, talk to the database, generate their initial party, and then send that back to the server. The server's gonna send that to the battle system to create the, the party itself, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, and then, of course, log in, uh, going to the database, checking the salted hash of that password, making sure that matches and is authenticated. 
It's on the next slide, but it is not okay to just store passwords in plain text. Hopefully you've heard this many, many times already by now. You've certainly heard it last semester. You've probably heard it just out in the wild, just being part of, uh, part of modern society. It's a, I think that's getting out there. It's a pretty common thing. Never store passwords in plain text. So we need to hash and salt. We, uh, it's on my next slide too. Well, I'm on the next slide. So um, we don't have a library for that yet. There's not one that I use in Scala in this class to be able to do the salting and hashing. So if you choose the authentication system, that's your first, one of your first tasks. Find a library, go out there, uh, do some searching, go into Maven Central or, uh, or just ask, ask the search engine, what library should I use for this? Read some documentation, learn how to use it, um, and get that library up and running. So that'll be one of your tasks if you choose the authentication system. But never, never, never do not handle, when you have those passwords, you're handling those passwords, always, always, always be secure. Always salted hashes. That's the only thing you're storing in your database. If you're not doing that, this is something I'll, I'll make sure the TAs know to check for this explicitly. They will have to see that you are storing salted hashes or else you really didn't build an authentication system at that point. If you have a very insecure authentication system, ooh, no, no go. Uh, and I wanted to make sure I said it explicitly, but you also load some information. So when they do log in, so when they register, create that database entry for their, not just their username and ha salted hash their password, but also the starting party and things like that. And then when they log in, you want to load up that party and get that in information out there. Um, most likely as a JSON string with all their party information, send that out, uh, out to the socket server so it can tell the other subsystems. So some account management as well. So once they're logged in, they're going to get dumped into the overworld. And the overworld system, of course, is going to control all the overworld mechanics. It's going to receive messages from the server uh, when a party is added or removed from the overworld, so when they connect, uh, when they log in or disconnect. And they're also going to, they're also going to receive from the server all of the movements, so the intended direction of each party. Uh, from there, you want to figure out all the movement. This is going to get periodic update messages to, uh, to update the location. Of, uh, of each of the parties, update all the locations, detect if any two parties should enter a battle, and notify the server if they enter a battle, and also notify the server of the new game state, the new locations and state of each of these parties. So for this, it's recommended, not required, but I do recommend, since we have all this code already existing, to pull on the physics engine and have the physics engine handle all this. Have each party as a dynamic object, have each impassable tile as a static object, and then overwrite, uh, overwrite the, uh, uh, the collision methods, the collide methods, to be able to get the behavior that you want from those. So that collide with dynamic object inside of a party, have that start a battle, and note, call the appropriate methods to start a battle. Uh, the, over, the overworld does have to manage the level of each, or sorry, it doesn't have to manage the level of each party. This is just something I recommend, something that I'm doing in my, my build, is if the, if the overworld knows the level of each party, it's a lot easier to build that JSON string to be able to send out with the game state. If, uh, so if you have a message that it can receive from the, the server, every time a party levels up and then store those levels inside the overworld, it can really help, uh, help build that, making that JSON string a lot easier. Otherwise, you're sending a lot of information. Uh, you would build the JSON without levels, send it to the server, parse all the JSON, add in the levels, and then stringify it again. It's not something you, not a business you want to be in. Um, so if this tracks the level as well, it, uh, It'll be easier. But this should not know anything else about each party. We'll talk about that 
in a, in a couple clicks here. Let's talk about the battle system. The last piece of this, the battle system is actually the only system that is going to use that code from demo one and lab activity two, lab activity four. This is the only system that's going to reuse all that code for a very important reason that I haven't really talked about for actors, but actors, it's, a, it, it's implicit, I think I kind of dabbled into this, uh, but I want to make sure this is explicit. Actors should never be sharing volatile information. They should never be sharing any references that can change state. So if we have a reference to a party object, we can, we technically can, we should not share that between actors. Because if one actor is changing the state of that party and another actor is accessing the state of that party simultaneously, we can run into some big trouble there. And those things, those operations can happen at the same time. So most times I qualify that with, well, technically it's not at the same time because inside the hardware and everything, it just acts like it is to us. But if it's in two separate actors, it can be happening at the same time. They are, they, they can, not necessarily are, but they can be running on separate threads and accessing that same information, that same variable simultaneously. And if one's modifying it and one's reading it, or they're both modifying it, they both modify the same variable. What's that variable after both modifications? Is it whoever's, whoever gets their last is probably going to win and they're going to get the value set. So, uh, so those are things we don't want. If two parties are in a battle, and I'm healing one of my characters while somebody's attacking it, and their attack gets in after my heal, it could cancel my heal out. We, we might get some really strange bugs like that, which will be very difficult to debug, cause huge headaches, not something we want to get into. So if you have any mutable state, any variables that can change, they should not be shared across actors. That's why our messages are always strings, or just objects, just uh, uh, no information, just an event occurred. That's why we're always sending strings, because strings can't change, they're not passed by reference, they're not going to change out from underneath us. But if we're sending parties and messages, no, can't do that. So, all that implies that all of the parties that are leveling up and gaining experience and taking damage and healing, all of those should be in the same actor, and that actor is the battle system. So the battle system is controlling all of that party stuff. The overworld is only tracking the locations and the movement of the parties. It doesn't know anything about the battle properties of those parties. It doesn't know the actions they can take in a battle or anything. Overworld doesn't even know, doesn't care. And shouldn't know because those things can change. Those are mutable, uh, mutable things. The only thing that can change that's shared is the level and we're gonna share that through message passing, not um, not by passing a reference, by sharing a reference. So with that out of the way, the battle is going to track all the parties. A party is going to be created as soon as someone logs in. The server will send that message to the overworld and the battle system. The battle system is going to create that party immediately when they log in. Not only when they're in a battle, it's always going to sh uh, store the state of each party, including the levels of each character, experience, and et cetera, uh, HP, and all that. So it's, the battle system is going to track them even when those play, parties are in the overworld. So next time they enter a battle, they're still in the same state. The battle is going to receive these battle start messages. These originate from the overworld. The overworld detects, uh, detects a battle started, sends that message to the server. The server sends that message to the battle system. It says, hey, battle started. These two parties are about to, to fight. Start a battle, initialize it. And once that's initialized, that's where we're going to use a lot of that code that we already wrote. We already know how to, uh, how to get that actions, how to take actions, how to take damage, how to gain levels. When a party is defeated, when a battle ends, how do we gain the experience and level up? We already have all those mechanics built. We're going to plug all those right into our battle system. The one thing we really need to do here is figuring out when it's a character's turn. And there's a one, uh, and this can get a little, so uh, let me back up a bit. So the, our first thought might be to just use a turn-based system, say, okay, it's your turn, then it's your turn, then it's your turn, then it's your turn. 
and just rotate the, the characters and just notify them that it's their turn. Their GUI lights up and says, hey, it's your turn, take your actions. But we want to build this as an MMO. And what if, uh, first, that could ruin the, the experience. If you have somebody slow that you're playing against, it takes a long time to choose the actions. That's fine for a standard JRPG. You just, uh, you take a while for your actions. It's just a CPU waiting for you. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, some, uh, but some JBR JRPGs even started this uh, active time battle system back in way back. Uh, they started using an active time battle system in some of these games where even while you're choosing your actions, the battle moves on. So it gets to be a little bit more of a real time battle. And that's what we want for the system. We don't want turn based, we don't want other users waiting for another user to take action. As soon as it's a character's turn, you get a notification, you choose your options, and then take that turn. And while you're choosing your options, if you're slow, somebody else can attack at that same time. So how do we build something like this? We want each character to have a separate timer, and each time we get an update message, we want to fill a certain percentage of that, uh, of that timer. And once we get to a certain time waited, once a character has had a certain amount of time elapsed since the last time that they took an action, send over the actor system to the server, say, hey, this character is ready for a turn. And as you're updating, you send that message off and you keep updating. And once another character reaches their time, their cooldown, or, or whatever you want to refer to it as, once they have waited long enough since the last action, tell the server, hey, it's this character's turn as well. And then you're going to receive messages back Eventually, who knows what happens in between, the battle system doesn't care, but eventually it's going to get messages back from the server that say, okay, this player, uh, this character took an action, this is the action, this is the target, process the damage or whatever, reset the ATB, uh, have them wait that certain amount of time again, so it's their turn again. So in this way, we can have a fully concurrent battle system, of course we're doing this with, uh, with actors, uh, we're already in an actor system, so we already have that set up for us. We have a totally concurrent battle system without ever waiting for a user action, without ever freezing the whole game on a certain user action. So if you're tackling the battle system, this is one of the, the bigger challenges with that. It's not overly difficult. If you have a good design and a good idea of how you want to implement this, it's not too bad. Um, but this is the biggest feature that's going to show on the front end that's going to make our game um, a bit more playable, in my opinion, if it's just turn-based, if the characters go in order, in, in a turn order, be uh, kind of boring. Uh, as an M Structured as an MMO, you're in a battle with a slow player and you're sitting there doing nothing for a while. Uh, instead, you get in a battle with a slow player, you get to take more turns than them with an ATP. Okay, and that's the project architecture. Any questions about any of that? I know it's a lot all at once, so probably have to digest it a while, but does anybody have questions at this point? So you should have at least a decent idea of which one of those you want to choose. So you can talk to your teammates, figure out um, how you want to split those ones up. Oops. So. It's the, the Google form link on the, the course website. It's uh, two questions, just kind of open-ended like the last one. Just give me some thoughts, give me at least a few sentences on each one. Uh, I'll go through, manually review them, and then add this course down the way. So given this architecture, the first question I want, want you to, to answer in that question one, how would we add an AI system to this? Where would that fit into this actor system? And how would we receive messages from the AI and have them choose how, how to move? How would we add that to the system? The second one, we're, we're kind of at, I'm always hesitant to say this, but, but I'll say it anyway. I'd say right about here, especially now that we see the whole project and what that, that entails, I'd say we're at about the peak of the difficulty of this course. And the only reason I'm hesitant to say this is, in my opinion, if, if somebody disagrees with me, they're gonna really hate me later in the semester. But in my opinion, 
the last two levels do get a little easier from here. When we're talking about concurrency and networking, these are really slippery topics. It just takes a long time to sit there and figure out what is even going on. And that's completely normal. That, that's, uh, uh, that's fine for you to think that way because these topics, especially when we're so used to just looking at a program and going, this line executes, then this line executes, then this line executes. Now when we have these programs with code scattered all over the place, and like this code can be running at the same time. This code is this code, and then this runs, and this can run. And if I send a message over here, I expect a message back at some point in time. It's a whole new way of thinking. It takes a while to wrap your head around. Uh, we will have another topic somewhat like that, recursion coming up. But in my opinion, I think this is a little tougher than, uh, than recursion to wrap your head. So if you're feeling overwhelmed right now, I know I said this a few weeks ago, but you know we. It doesn't get, there's not another big difficulty spike, is what I, what I really want to say if you're feeling overwhelmed. If you made it this far, you should be okay for the rest of the semester. If you're feeling good about your clicker, you got your points for clicker, and today's lecture didn't completely overwhelm you, like you can kind of follow along and you kind of know what I'm saying, even if you don't quite know how you would implement it yet. If you can kind of follow along today's lecture and you're comfortable with Clicker, let's say you're going to be good for the rest of the semester. There's not going to be any, any extra really hard-hitting things that come out of nowhere. I mean, we do have genetic algorithm uh, coming up. That is, there's no sugar coding. It's a hard homework. Um, but I think if you make it through what we've just been through in the last three weeks, you're going to make it through fine. So with all that said, the second question is, just how are you holding up? Let me know how you're doing. How are you feeling with your class? Uh, any feedback? If you want to vent, that's fine too. Uh, just how you doing?